Um, I'm very excited to be here to share with you some of our recent work. One of my long-term research goals is to create a universal 3D perception system. A universal system should be able to perform dense reconstruction, that is, to reconstruct the depth and motion of every single pixel, including the static background and the dynamic foreground objects. A universal system should also be able to reconstruct arbitrary scenes, including weird objects and shapes that have never been seen before. In particular, the system should not rely on any semantic knowledge. It should not assume any known categories, objects, or scenes. The system should be uh, able to deal with completely novel geometry. Why no semantics? It is not because I don't care about semantics. Rather, my hypothesis is that geometry should be the foundation for semantics, not the other way around, because it seems like evolution spent most of its time evolving the visual system for interacting with the visual world, not describing it in words. If this hypothesis is true, this may suggest that geometry may be at least as difficult as semantics. Note that a particular application may benefit from both geometry and semantics. In this case, it is, it is still useful to improve geometry independently of semantics because such improvement is more likely to carry over to the full system, even when the full system already benefits from semantics. Regardless, universal 3D perception would be very useful. It is essential in robotics and AR VR. Today, I'd like to share some of our recent work towards such a 3D perception system. I'll first talk about reconstructing 3D from just a single image. Then I'll talk about 3D from multiple views. Let's start with single image 3D. Why should we care about single image 3D? This might not be obvious because for robotics or AR VR, we can always have multiple cameras. The main reason for studying single image 3D is to understand static images and monocular video. If you care about semantic tasks like object recognition, I believe 3D is key to few shot recognition because with 3D shape, you can easily be invariant to occlusion and viewpoint change without seeing examples of different viewpoints and occlusion. For example, for this project, for this object, you probably haven't seen before, you can easily detect it in this new image because you can match its shape even from a different viewpoint. In fact, even the best object detector today still has issues with occlusion viewpoint change. With occlusion, the car can turn into a bed. With viewpoint change, the car can turn into a cell phone. This also applies to understanding relations. In this example, we see two identical figures. Their interaction is only apparent with 3D information. In fact, it can be useful to describe the spatial relations of objects from a single image. And we have constructed a benchmark for spatial relation recognition with human notations. And we find that the best recognition models today do not perform well and are in fact no better than a simple baseline using just 2D boxes as input. This shows that the existing models have no 3D perception capability. But will 3D perception help? We constructed another benchmark using synthetic data and human notations. And we found that 3D input can make a big difference in recognizing spatial relations. Another reason to study single image 3D is for applications in computational photography, such as synthetic depth of field or view synthesis. Last but not the least, I believe single image 3D is important even when you have multiple views because monocular 3D cues can help resolve ambiguities in stereo matching, especially with textureless or specular surfaces. Now, hopefully you're convinced that single image 3D is worth studying. How should we go about it? A basic task in single image 3D is depth estimation. We can train a deep neural network to do this if we can collect ground truth training data. To do that, we can use depth sensors. But the problem is that uh, the, they are tedious to use and have limits in range and resolution. 
and fail on specular or transparent objects. As a result, we only have RGBD data on limited types of scenes, such as indoor rooms and driving scenes. If we train a network on such data, it would work fine on certain types of scene, but fail on arbitrary images. For example, on this image, the network thinks the sky is closer than the building in the center, probably because it assumes an in indoor room. So one key challenge of single 3D is to obtain training data for images in the wild. And I will now describe some of the strategies we have explored. The first is crowdsourcing. The idea of crowdsourcing is to get depth ground truth through human visual system. The advantage of this approach is that we can use arbitrary images on the internet. But there is one problem. We cannot really ask a human what is the depth of a particular pixel in meters. We instead ask alternative questions. For example, we can ask about relative depth. Given two points, which one is closer? This drew inspiration from earlier work that crowdsourced relative reflectance. We construct a data set of 500,000 Flickr images called depth in the wild. We randomly sampled a pair of points per image and have humans tell us which point is closer. Given the relative depth annotations, how do we train a deep, uh, depth system? Prior work showed that we can train a deep network to predict binary ordering between super pixels and then perform optimization to solve for a depth map consistent with the predicted binary ordering. We proposed a simple approach where we train a network to directly predict a pixel-wise depth map with a ranking loss to encourage the predict depth map to be consistent with annotations of ordinal relations. Empirically, we see that these human annotations do help us get better depth on arbitrary images. This is a qualitative example. We can take the idea of crowdsourcing beyond just relative depth. In this follow-up work, we ask humans to annotate surface normals. We develop the UI where the annotator adjusts a gauge figure until the orientation looks correct. With these human annotated surface normals, we can train a network to predict a per pixel depth map such that the predicted depth is consistent with the human annotated surface normals. We now have human annotations of relative depth and surface normals, but one issue is that the annotations are quite sparse. They don't give us the dense geometry like a depth sensors does. So the question is, can we get per pixel depth from humans? It turns out that we can. In this CDPR 2020 work, we managed to create such a data set called OASIS. It consists of crowdsourced dense 3D reconstructions of random image, internet images. Given an input image, we ask humans to annotate certain 3D properties, including normals and boundaries. Then we solve for per pixel depth through constraint optimization. This is the annotation UI, which allows a user to draw annotations and see a live rendering of the reconstruction. Let me show you a demo. Here, the user decides where to add annotations. They first select a region to annotate, they're now drawing boundaries of depth discontinuities. Now they're drawing boundaries of normal discontinuities. Now they are placing surface normals. They can sparsely place surface normals and the UI will automatically interpolate. And they can fine tune the normals. Yes. Uh, this is just the average people. Uh, we, uh, we, we can do this with uh, uh, workers from Amazon Mechanical Turk, for example. Uh, with a little bit of training, we'll have a tutorial that uh, uh, make them, uh, get them to, uh, to be familiar with the UI. And uh, um, they can see a live reconstruction and then iterate. We have collected annotations for over 200,000 images. 
On average, each image takes about 300 seconds. This means a total of 20,000 hours of human time. In terms of total human time, this is already a lot more than the scale of ImageNet, which has many more images, but each image is much faster to annotate. Now let me give more some details about the specific types of annotations we have. The first type is occlusion. Occlusion is where there's depth discontinuity. And since there's occlusion, there's also depth ordering. We ask the human to specify which side of the occlusion is closer. We also have folds, which are normal discontinuity. We also have surface normals. The user annotates sparse normals until the interpolated dense normal field is correct. We also ask if each surface segment is planar or curved. Finally, if there are multiple planar surfaces, we ask if any of those are parallel or orthogonal. Now, with all these types of human notations, we reconstruct per pixel depth by solving a constraint optimization problem. How good are the human notations? We compare them against sensor ground truth from the tanks and temples data set. We see that the error is fairly small compared to the mean and standard deviation of depth. Interestingly, we discovered that a main source of error is due to the ambiguity in estimating surface normals. For example, let's say this is the ground truth geometry from a depth sensor. It turns out that each human annotated surface normal can be a little off and off by the same global amount. This global rotation can cause large errors in terms of absolute depth, even though the shape looks qualitatively correct. If we account for this global rotation by applying the best possible global rotation to correct the human notations, then the depth error is reduced substantially. Last but not least, because we now have rich annotations, we can evaluate not just depth estimation, but also other subtasks for single image 3D, such as predicting surface normals, predicting occlusion boundaries and folds, and instance segmentation of planes. For many of these subtasks, it was the first time such data was available for training and evaluation. In addition to crowdsourcing, we have also been exploring using computer graphics to get training data for single image 3D. Using synthetic data is not new in computer vision. It has many advantages, including easily available high quality ground truth. However, a main drawback is that we don't have a way to automatically generate diverse realistic scenes representative of the real world. A high quality photorealistic rendering usually involves a large amount of manual effort by human artists. Here we ask if we can reduce the human labor by learning to generate synthetic training data. Let's first take a look at a typical pipeline of using synthetic data. A generator generates synthetic data, which we then use to train a network, which is then evaluated on real images. Typically, a lot of manual effort is involved in designing the generator, including decisions regarding shapes, materials, scene compositions, etc. Here, we'd like to automatically optimize these decisions. For example, in this CVPR 2018 work, we show how to optimize the 3D shapes used to render synthetic images. We use a genetic algorithm to evolve very simple shapes to form complex shapes in order to maximize the test performance on real images. We show that on a single image 3D task, using such shapes evolved from simple primitives can outperform using manually created CAD models. One drawback of this approach is that we are essentially optimizing a black box function, which evaluates how good a configuration of design decisions is in terms of generalization performance on a uh, validation set of real images. This black box optimization can be quite expensive. In this follow-up work at uh, CVPR 2020, we try to address this efficiency issue by observing that some parts of this the function are actually differentiable and have analytical gradients. 
for the non-differentiable part, we use numerical gradients and combine them with the analytical gradients to get the gradients for the entire function. We call this approach hybrid gradients. And we show that using such hybrid gradients can improve the efficiency of the optimization and result in faster convergence. And we're excited to see more recent progress along this line, such as this auto flow paper from Google, which learns to generate a synthetic training set for optical flow. Now, let me describe yet another strategy for getting training data for a single image 3D. The idea is to use web videos. In particular, we can run existing structure for motion systems on web videos. Such a system detects sparse feature points, match them, and then solves for camera poses and depth. In the end, we get depth for a sparse set of pixels for video frame. Such depth can be used as ground truth for a single image 3D. However, one issue with this approach is that classical structure for motion systems are not very reliable. Many of these reconstructed depth values are actually incorrect. If we evaluate the depth ordering, the error rate can be as high as 28%. In this CEPR 2019 work, we ask if we can improve the quality of the ground truth depth by filtering out the incorrect reconstruction. Our idea is to train a quality assessment network that decides if each reconstruction is good enough. Our hypothesis is that this task is easier than three reconstruction itself. We just need to reliably identify a small proportion of good reconstruction because we can have an unlimited supply of web videos. And it turns out that existing heuristics such as reprojection error do not work well for assessing quality. This plot shows that the reprojection error is poorly correlated with the actual reconstruction quality. This is because reconstruction error really tells you, only tells you how well the geometry constraints are satisfied given the feature matches, but the feature matches themselves can be incorrect to start with. So we train a quality assessment network. Its input consists of features based on the geometry of the reconstruction and does not involve any pixel values. This way, the network can be trained entirely on synthetic data and still generalize well to real images. Using this quality assessment network, we constructed the YouTube 3D dataset, which resulted in several billions of relative depth pairs that can be used to train single image 3D. And with YouTube 3D, we show that we can improve the state of the art of single image depth in the wild. Now, having uh, presented our work on single image 3D, I'd like to switch gear to multi-view 3D. Multi-view 3D is a success story in computer vision. There are too many successes to list here, but in general, we now understand multi-view geometry very well and sparse reconstruction of static scenes can work very well. However, multi-view 3D is far from solved in the sense that we still can't produce accurate pixel-wise reconstruction for an arbitrary scene. Typically, classical multi-view 3D approaches formulate an optimization problem over continuous variables, such as 2D motion, depth, and optimizes an objective function that measures the quality of the solution. The objective function typically includes terms that measure the satisfaction of geometric constraints, which are analytical equations that describe how 3D points move in space and are projected into 2D images. Once we have defined an objective, we use an optimizer to search for a solution. This is a typically an algorithm that iteratively refines the solution. A main limitation of this optimization approach is that the objective function can be hard to specify. Geometric constraints alone are known to be insufficient. And it is difficult to come up with heuristics that cover all corner cases. Another limitation is that even if the objective is reasonably defined, the optimization problem itself can be highly non-convex and the optimizer can be easily stuck in the local minimum. 
in the last decade, deep learning has emerged as a powerful tool for computer vision. It offers a strategy that's quite different from optimization-based approaches. During inference time, we do not need to formulate an optimization objective. The solution is produced by a network with learned weights. Deep learning has been particularly successful for semantic tasks where it was traditionally difficult to handwrite an optimization objective. Deep learning has been applied to multi-view problems too. The earlier works typically use a generic convolution architecture to map inputs to outputs. However, unlike the semantic tasks for which deep learning produced drastic improvement, the success of these early deep networks on these geometry problems was not as clear cut. While these deep networks can achieve faster inference, but they, they generally do not outperform the best classical optimization-based approaches. Moreover, they are often difficult to train and do not generalize very well to new data sets. In this talk, I will discuss a different approach that still uses deep learning, but borrows significantly from classical optimization-based approaches. The overall idea is to design deep architectures that behave like optimizers during inference time. This strategy involves two main ingredients, recurrent iterative updates and analytical layers encoding geometric constraints. In particular, I will talk about Visual SLAM, a classical vision task that seeks to build a 3D map of the environment and track the camera trajectory. Visual SLAM has traditionally been approached using our symbolic knowledge of geometry. In particular, we know that the 2D motion or optical flow of a pixel is the result of the 3D motion T of a 3D point X. That is, we can write down a closed form analytical function that relates the 2D flow F with the 3D point X and the 3D motion T. This gives us an algorithm consisting of two steps. First, we can estimate the 2D motion of pixels. For example, by comparing pixels with hand-designed features. In step two, we can formulate an optimization problem that finds the 3D points and 3D motion to maximally satisfy the analytical equation. That is, we try to make the left side of the equation as close as possible to the right side. However, this classical approach does not work too well. It is not very robust and has frequent catastrophic failures. Recently, there have also been many approaches based on deep learning. In these approaches, the deep network is trained to directly predict the camera pose and depth. The deep learning-based approaches are sometimes more robust, but by and large, they have not been able to match the accuracy of classical systems. In addition, they do not generalize well to new data sets. For example, this bar plot shows error from a standard benchmark. The three recent deep learning approaches perform poorly against WorpSlam, which is a leading classical approach. In this talk, I will describe a new system we have developed. It is much more accurate and robust than prior systems, classical or learning-based. It generalizes very well. We train it only on synthetic data, and it works on real data zero shot. JoySlam is a deep network whose design is inspired by classical approaches and makes heavy use of the geometric knowledge. Now, I will show you how we came up with this design. Like in classical approaches, we first consider the problem of estimating 2D motion. This task is also called optical flow if we estimate 2D motion for every single pixel. Optical flow has been traditionally approached as an optimization problem where we try to find a flow field that maximizes the visual similarity between corresponding pixels, as well as a regularization term that encourages plausible flow fields. The first deep network for optical flow was FlowNet. It applies the UNet to concatenated frames and directly predicts the flow field. It is very simple and very fast, but it did not outperform the best optimization-based approaches. Since FlowNet, deep networks developed for optical flow have been generally trying to incorporate more inductive biases used by classical approaches. For example, PWCNet was a very successful design that includes a warping layer, cost volumes, as well as limited iterative refinement on the image pyramid. Taking inspirations from the classical optimization-based approaches, we proposed a new deep architecture called RAFT, 
the most important difference of wrap from prior work is that it behaves a lot more like a traditional optimizer. It starts with initial flow field and performs many rounds of iterative refinement. That works very well. It achieved large accuracy improvements over prior state of the art. It is also very fast in both training and test. And in particular, it generalizes very well to new data sets. Now let's walk through the details. Given two input frames or images, Raft first extracts features for each pixel and then compute visual similarities for all pairs of pixels. That is for each pixel in the first image, we compute its similarity with all pixels in the second image through a dot product. This gives a 2D similarity heat map for each pixel in the first image. Then we pull this similarity heat map multiple times to lower resolutions to generate a pyramid of heat maps. These similarities allow us to construct feature vectors used for refining the flow field. Let's say we have a current flow estimate for this green pixel. That is the current corresponding pixel is the red pixel. Then we retrieve the similarity values from a small neighborhood around the red pixel at each level of the pyramid. For example, here we have four levels in the pyramid and from each level we retrieve nine by nine values. We then concatenate all the similarity values to form a single feature vector for this green pixel. This feature vector essentially contains similarity information around the current flow estimate. It tells us how good the current flow is and where are better similarities. Because the use of a pyramid, we can include similarities from a very large area. Given the features retrieved from the all pairs visual similarities, we update the flow field using a standard convolutional GRU. At each iteration, it outputs a new hidden state and in, an increment to the flow field. It's worth noting that although the motivation is that after training, the GRU will behave like an optimizer, we have not specified any explicit optimization objective, and there is no explicit computation of gradients. To train raft, at each duration, we compare the predicted flow to the ground truth flow. The final loss is a weighted average of the loss at each duration with exponentially increasing weights for later iterations. This loss encourages the network to behave like an optimizer in the sense that it produces a sequence of predictions that converge to the correct answer. On Sintel, a standard benchmark, Raft improves prior results by 30% on both versions of the data set. Raft is used by all of the top three teams in the robust vision challenge, which emphasizes robustness and evaluates methods on the diverse set of data sets. Our approach can be easily adapted to depth prediction from stereo matching, which is essentially a 1D optical flow problem. It ranked first on the Middlebury benchmark at the time of publication. It is especially good at recurring fine details. These are qualitative results. We can look at some visualizations. We can see that many of the thin structures are well recovered. We now have an end-to-end -end network that predicts 2D flow. What should we do next to recover 3D? A straightforward method is to just copy the classical approach where we solve for 3D through optimization. In particular, we formulate an optimization problem called dense bundle adjustment. Here we are given a co-visibility graph where the nodes represent the video frames and the edges connect co-visible frames. And we have predicted optical flow between each pair of co-visible frames. And we want to solve for the depth maps for all frames and the absolute global poses of all cameras. And the goal here is that for all pairs of frames, the predicted flow is as close as possible to the flow induced by the depth maps and the camera poses. Note that the induced flow 
is a closed form analytical function of depths and camera poses. This gives us a nonlinear least squares optimization problem, which can be solved by iterative algorithms like Gauss-Newton. Thus, we now have a basic approach to SLAM. We can run raft to obtain optical flow for all pairs of visible frames, and then solve dense bundle adjustment using an iterative algorithm such as Gauss-Newton. However, this approach turns out to work very poorly. One reason is that the predicted optical flow has a lot of outliers, which will derail the bundle adjustment step. Outliers can occur due to a variety of reasons, such as occluded or out of frame pixels, dynamic objects, and flow estimation errors. How do we exclude outliers? One idea is to predict an additional confidence map for the pixels to give outliers low confidence. But how does the network know which pixels are outliers? Another idea is to use feedback from the DBA optimization. The outliers are those pixels with large errors. Now, putting these thoughts together, the logical next step is to tightly couple the raft iterations and the Gauss-Newton iterations. That is, we tightly couple a neural network and optimization layer the neural network shapes the optimization and the optimization gives feedback to the neural network. Now let's look at the details. For each pair of frames in a co-visibility graph, we extract features and compute visual similarities. This is similar to raft, except that we operate not just on the single pair of frames. Instead, we operate on all pairs of frames simultaneously. Then we perform iterative updates. And each update is on all depth maps and all camera poses simultaneously. Now let's look inside this update operator and let me walk you through it. At each iteration, we take the current estimate of depth maps and poses, and then we compute the induced optical flow for each pair of frames. Here we do it for frame I and J. What's important is that the induced flow is a differentiable closed form function of depths and poses. The particulars of the expressions do not matter as much. And we'd like to emphasize again that this is done simultaneously for all pairs of frames in the co-visibility graph. And this induced flow is given to a convolutional GRU as input. The same induced flow is also used to retrieve the visual similarities in the neighborhood, and the visual similarities are given to the convolutional GRU. Given these simil visual similarities, the GRU can evaluate how good the flow is and suggest how it should be revised. The GRU may also detect outliers by looking for very bad visual similarities. Now let's look at the GRU. At each iteration, the GRU outputs a flow revision and a confidence map. The flow revision is changes to the flow field recommended by the GRU. The GRU also outputs a confidence map to give low confidence to outliers. The last piece of the update operator is a dense bundle adjustment layer. Its goal is to answer the question, how to update depth and poses such that the induced flow is better. It takes all flow revisions, the confidence maps and the induced flow and outputs an update to depth and camera poses. The DBA layer operates globally on the entire co-visibility graph. Its inputs are from all pairs of frames and its outputs are for all depth maps and camera poses. Inside this DBA layer, we solve an optimization problem where the variables are an update to all depths and poses. The optimization objective is defined over all pairs of frames in the co-visibility graph. For each pair of frames, we compute the flow induced by the current estimate of depths and poses. And then we revise the induced flow using the flow revision recommended by the GRU. We also compute a new induced flow after we apply the updates to depths and poses. And we compute the difference between the new induced flow and the revised flow. Basically, 
in this optimization, we ask, how can we update the current depth and poses such that the induced flow can be revised as recommended by the GRU? Finally, to exclude outliers, we use the per pixel confidence weights given by the GRU. Effectively, this optimization is only done on the subset of pixels considered to be in liars. One remaining issue is that this optimization is a nonlinearly sparse, which does not have a closed form solution. To address this, we linearize the objective using the Taylor expansion, which makes the linearly sparse problem. Now we have a differentiable closed form solution. For those of you familiar with classical approaches, this is called a Gauss-Newton step. It's worth noting that we implement this layer as fully differentiable. That is, we backprop gradients through all of its inputs, including the revision flow and the confidence map. Right now, it's just one iteration. But uh, that's a parameter you can change. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, there's actually no backpropagation through inverse. So it turns out that you can use the implicit uh, differentiation so that the, the backpropagation actually, you know, you just need to do Cholesky decomposition and, and that will work out. Uh, so actually, you don't have to, yeah, yes, you differentiate through inverse, but not explicitly. Okay, thanks. Um, so during training, we have a post loss and a flow loss. At each iteration, we compare the current post estimate with the ground truth, and we compare the induced flow with the ground truth. Note that there is no direct supervision on the confidence map, but because the DBA layer is fully differentiable, the network gets gradients for the confidence map and can learn to predict useful weights. This is a visualization of an actual confidence map predicted by the network. We see that the confidence map makes sense uh, in that the confidence on horizontal motion is high for vertical structures. Our full system is composed of a front end and a back end. The front end performs feature extraction and bundle adjustment over a local window. The back end performs global bundle adjustment over a large global time window up to thousands of frames. We build the co-visibility graph through simple thresholding of the flow magnitude between frames. With custom GPU kernels, we are able to run real time with two GPUs and our system is trained only on monocular input. To extend our system to stereo input, we simply augment the frame graph with the additional stereo frames. And in the DBE optimization, we treat the relative poses between the left and right frames as known and fixed. To work with RGBD video, we still treat depth as a variable to optimize, but we use sensor depth as a prior in the DBA layer. In the optimization, we have additional term that says the estimated depth should be as close as possible to the sensor depth. This treatment is to account for the noise and missing observations in sensor depth. It's worth noting that there's no ray training needed for our system to work on stereo RGBD. No, that's, now let's look at some results. Uh, Tardinair is a synthetic benchmark and is also used by us as training data. The scenes are photorealistic, diverse, and challenging. Last year, there was a slam challenge using this data. On the official test set, we have reduced the error by about 60% in both the monocular setting and the stereo setting. In addition, we are 16 times faster than the best prior system. UROP, uh, UROC MAV is a standard benchmark with video captured from small drones. Classical methods generally do very well on this data set and do much better than learning-based approaches. And the best of prior results are from classical approaches. Uh, this plot shows the errors from each testing sequence. And the last column shows the average error. The dashed bars indicate catastrophic failure. Here we see that we have reduced error by a very large amount. There's also a result on UROC with stereo input. We do much better than OrbSlam 3, a leading classical approach. This is results from Tom RGBD, a very difficult SLAM benchmark. 
This plot shows the errors for each testing sequence with the average in the last column. We can see that OPSAM3 has frequent catastrophic failures. The learning-based approaches are more robust, but our approach has much lower error among all approaches. This is results from ETH3D, another standard SAM benchmark. The evaluation considers both error and catastrophic failure. The x-axis in this plot is the localization error. The y-axis is the number of testing sequences on which a SLAM system can get a lower error. The higher the curve, the better. We rank number one on this benchmark and we're much more robust than the second place. It's worth noting that our approach generalizes very well. All of our results across multiple data sets and the modalities are achieved by a single model trained only once and entirely on synthetic data. Yeah. Our loop closures handle automatic because we have this global uh, co-visibility graph and then we do our DBA optimization on essentially the entire graph. So, so as long as you can detect that two frames are co-visible and then you have loop closure. Let's look at some qualitative results. This is a sequence from ETH3D. Uh, these are results from two popular existing systems. Both of them failed midway catastrophically because of uh, lost feature tracking. This is our reconstruction. Uh, we not only successfully track the full trajectory, but also have a much denser reconstruction. Um, I think, uh, I, I don't recall if we had full map results uh, reported for the, because these are standard benchmarks. Uh, you know, we, uh, if, if some, I, I'm not sure if full map was ever evaluated on, on any of them, but I can, I can check. Mm -hmm. These are additional results from the tanks and temples benchmark, as well as iPhone videos we took ourselves. Oh, he says, it, it, yes, because, because this is, we, we have this global uh, backend, which look at basically all the thousands of frames and then uh, detect co-visible frames. So when you, then we basically perform dense bundle adjustments on this entire graph. So this graph will cover all the possible loops. Yeah. We have applied the same methodology to a number of other tasks, for example, this is video to depth with a recurrent unit and a perspective endpoint, an analytical layer. It achieves 50% improvement over prior work. This is a scene flow that is estimating per pixel 3D motion from RGBD video of dynamic scene. This architecture has an analytical layer that performs dense model adjustments with soft pixel grouping. It improved the state of the art accuracy from 30% to 80%. This is 60 multi-object pose estimation. The architecture has an analytical layer that does bi-directional perspective endpoints. We achieve save art on the standard DOP benchmark. I have shown you how we can design optimization inspired neural architectures to advance the state of the art, often substantially on many multi-view tasks. Now I'd like to talk about a tool that addresses a common issue that you might encounter in training such architectures. The issue involves 3D transformation groups, which are matrix Lie groups extensively used in 3D vision and robotics. The three main ones are the rotations, the rigid body transforms, and the similarity transforms. 3D transformation groups are used in the optimization inspired 3D architectures I presented today. For example, we may want to average to SE3 transform. Here, 
we represent an SE3 transform as a four by four matrix. Because the SE3 group is not closed under matrix addition, we need to first map them into exponential coordinates, perform addition, and then map results back. However, if you try to backprop through this computation graph in current deep learning libraries like PyTorch, you will likely encounter numerical issues. Uh, for example, if the input of the graph is the identity transform, PyTorch 3D will return a NAND gradient. To better illustrate the problem, let's consider the simpler graph with rotation group. In this graph, a rotation is represented as a three by three matrix. And we have a matrix log operation that maps the matrix to a three dimensional vector. During backprop, we first get the gradient for this vector psi. To backprop through this log operator, we multiply the gradient with the Jacobian of the log, which is a three by nine matrix. And we obtain a nine dimensional gradient for the rotation matrix R. We call this gradient the ambient space gradient because the rotation matrix R is restricted to a manifold inside the ambient space of all possible three by three matrices. This ambient space gradient just tells you the best ascend direction in the ambient space without caring about the manifold. That is, you can go off the manifold if you follow this gradient. There's nothing theoretically wrong with this ambient gradient for backpropagation because it is only used as the intermediate result. But computing it can cause numerical issues because the formula can have many singularities. For example, this is the formula for the matrix log of rotation. It involves the inverse of cosine, which has a singular gradient at one, which will be triggered by an identity rotation. To get around the numerical issues, one solution we found effective is to compute gradients in the tangent space instead. The tangent space at a point is formed by all the feasible directions along which you're allowed to travel on the manifold. The tangent space gradient is the projection of the ambient space gradient onto the tangent space, throwing away the orthogonal component, which is not useful anyways. Practically, this means that we do backpropagation in the tangent space. For 3D rotation, the gradient we get will be three numbers instead of nine. The three numbers represent coordinates in a local frame in the tangent space. Accordingly, the Jacobian of the log operator will be three by three instead of three by nine. It turns out that after you work out the math, tangent space backprop has several advantages. To, the formula is much simpler and easier to implement. It's numerically stable. It is representation agnostic, meaning that it doesn't matter which representation you use for your 3D transformation groups. For 3D rotations, you can use matrix or quaternions or Euler angles. The gradient is the same. And the gradient can be directly used to optimize over 3D transformation groups. And we have developed a plug and play PyTorch library called LeeTorch. It allows you to incorporate 3D transformation groups into your architecture as painless as regular tensors. This is all I have today. And uh, of course, none of these works would have been possible without my former and current PhD students. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions now. This was a really wonderful talk, and uh, the end was the best. <laughs> Thank you. With the uh, uh, liturgy. I think I will pass uh, this to the panelists who will gonna take questions both from here and also from uh, remotely. Does anyone here have questions? Yes. It's a nice talk. Um, so for the rotation translation estimation, the, the two parts are actually not related, right? So you can have the rotation estimate usually taken out first yeah. and then the translation estimate later, right? So the rotation estimation actually is a little bit more reliable than translation usually, isn't it? Uh, 
So, uh, but here in our case, you know, we just treat them uh, right. together. We right. haven't tried treating them separately. Right. But um, in practice, usually, you know, the rotation can be assayed fairly re reasonably well. And once you have that, then it's a translation problem. And the flow itself also become more constrained because, you know, you just need to figure out 1D flow rather than 2D flow. Uh, so are we talking about uh, solving the, for the camera posts? Uh, yeah, camera posts and the flow, right? You want to solve both at the same time. But uh, mm -hmm. once the rotation is taken out, the tr it's right. just translation. And then translation is 1D sure. flow rather than sure. 2D flow. Um, I, I should say that, you know, this sort of this general framework will allow different kinds of optimization iteration. You can certainly do sort of, you can split your variables and sort of do block learning descent. Uh, you know, we, we have sort of actually our uh, deep V2D video to depth system actually was more like that. Sort of, you know, we actually do not, solve depth and camera pose together we actually solve depth given camera pose or give a, a camera pose given depth so there are many variations you can do so i think you know splitting let's say rotation translation uh and, and so that could be one possibility that's not something we have tried but but yeah but it, it might be to better results yeah I'm just trying to put the flow into a more constrained space once you have the rotations out i think yeah right certainly for example you know right now we're solving depth and uh Pose together, you can certainly imagine an alternative which says, let's solve camera pose first. Once you solve camera pose, then depth becomes multi view stereo by searching along the epipolar lines. Mm -hmm. uh, that's certainly a possibility. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. So the combination with optimization and the network was really great. Uh, uh, I the only point that makes me a little skeptical is uh, the outliers mm -hmm. uh, because uh, just checking the output of a confidence or a covariance matrix in the past uh, it was not sufficient uh, mm -hmm. that's why there were so many papers on ransack minimal yep. problems uh, uh, global optimization and bundle adjustment and uh, uh, mm -hmm. not global robust optimization right. and so on so what could we do better there? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question because uh, you know th right now our architecture doesn't. I don't think it has the elements that are used in Ransack. So Ransack essentially says that okay, let's sort of explore multiple things simultaneously instead of just like going through one solution. I explore in a small neighborhood, right? Um, so, but that might be an idea we can incorporate. But that's a, that's a very good point. So, so right, right now, sort of, you know, we are, we are still sort of just, you know, starting from one initial solution and refine it. So that, you know, in itself, that this, this sort of can, can have some limitations. Uh, but you can think maybe, you know, you could, you could sort of start from multiple Cs and sort of then have a behavior that's more similar to Ransack. Uh, so this is something, you know, we haven't tried, but, but, but yeah, but, you know, there are, there are other ideas from, um, classical approaches that we haven't incorporated, uh, that those would certainly be interesting. Uh, you mean the, the size of the network? Uh, actually, I, I don't have that off the top of my head. Uh, so I can, uh, so, so the, the network itself, I mean, it's, it's just a convolutional GRU. So the, uh, I, I don't actually don't remember the exact, uh, that I can get. Right, right. right. So, so what, what the, is the, the, the question about number of parameters in the network, or is it? Um, so let me see if I. Okay, so basically, the here is the slide about uh, about outliers. Uh, so this is a sort of a confidence map that was actually predicted by the network. Um, so that's what the what sort of the, this sort of this shows the inliers the network uh, uses. So the you know that that's the uh, colored uh, pixels. 
okay in uh, because it, it, in in this problem there is a lot of uh, uh, the network can cheat in many many ways by mapping uh, the flow to uh, incorrect pixels because uh, then uh, there is a uh, i should say a self consistency oh, that the I, I, likes I, to make I, I i see what you meant uh, okay here actually so you i think maybe your point is that uh, maybe why 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 don't why doesn't the network just say everything is an outlier or so that so that then the optimization objective will be so like, like you have a yeah. trivial optimization to solve yes so oh, okay what what, uh, what forces the network to work well How right uh, sure sure yeah um, so the the point is that uh, here the network needs to is to supervise the learning during training the network still needs to have a low loss the loss here. The network's goal is not to make the the optimization loss though. Instead, the up, during training, the network needs to minimize the supposed loss. So, if let's say if you have a trivial optimization in this DBA layer, then the output will be will, will basically be wrong when compared to the post ground truth and uh, so and uh, the flow ground truth. Okay. So, in the sense that the net the, the the network should learn to how to uh, come up with the optimization problem such that the result optimization will be good compared to the ground truth result. So that if the network sort of decides very bad, uh, you know, confidence map for the outliers, then the result of the optimization layer will be wrong compared to ground truth. Then the network will be penalized. It will not train very well during training. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thanks. online question. Um, so Mingzi asks, do you have any suggestions on droid slam model compression? Model compression? Um, uh, so so there, are, there are, I think, a lot of uh, places for improving efficiency. So for example, you know, if your goal is only to estimate camera pose, um, you know, we see that actually there is a lot of uh, computation that's not necessary because you don't really need uh, the, you know, the flow for every single pixel, right? You just need a sparse set. Uh, often that's enough to, for you to get camera pose. Uh, so one possibility is to basically sort of uh, do some type of dynamic execution in the sense that, you know, you, you, you can, for example, se select a subset of pixels and only, you know, uh, you know, uh, trying to find correspondences from the subset and this can cut down the computation quite a bit. Um, and also, you know, you can uh, have, you can try standard techniques for pruning networks, uh, try to make it more use, using, uh, let's say, using more efficient uh, backbones. Um, so uh, these are the possibilities. So efficiency is something that we also care about and we are sort of actively studying. Thank you everybody for joining today.